I'll send out you. Um, next slide, please. So a little bit about 3C Run. We are the Tri-County Regional Energy Network, a collaborative between San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, and Ventura counties. Uh, we work to improve energy efficiency in our region by offering free programs to building professionals. 3C Run is a, a rate payer funded um, program. So we use utility bills uh, through, the, through the public's good charge. Um, and this is um, regional money that we use to put back into our program. So that's a little bit about 3C Run. Next slide, please. And yeah, if you see any of our staff members here today with this background, feel free to chat us directly to ask any questions. Um, please don't hesitate to, to ask any questions. We're, we're here for you. Um, next slide, please. So this series, this course today is part of a series of six classes, an intro the buildings, to building science and enclosures, heat pumps, and water heating and electrification. Today, we're in the enclosure part of it. Uh, it's focused on building practices to exceed code and optimize performance. Um, outcomes are improved by tenant health and comfort and minimize environmental impact. The series is designed to provide a solid foundation in the building science knowledge needed for high performance work. Um, without further ado, I'll give Rick the, the chance to explain a little bit more about today's class. Uh, yeah, so to tune in and we're, we're here to answer any questions. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So we've snuck in the word thermal into our, our title. So thermal enclosure best practices, kind of neglecting to talk about water intrusion and some of the other things that we need our enclosures to do. So more focused on comfort and energy efficiency and um, all the performance criteria needed to make our ceilings, walls, and floors perform properly. So this is my background list that we went through in class one, the introduction. And the relevant point is point three. Back in the 80s, I designed and installed uh, HVAC systems in residential buildings and eventually purchased and started building performance test equipment. So we had the ability to commission our work and so by the early 90s, I owned both a blower door and an infrared camera. And with those two, two commissioning devices, we quickly determined that the building enclosure, the insulation and air sealing weren't performing well. And we became insulation subcontractors also. So, since the early 90s, we performed both as an HVAC sub and an insulation sub in residential buildings, figuring if we're gonna put conditioned air into an enclosure, the enclosure better be uh, able to keep it in and provide true comfort. So our agenda for today, we'll spend most of our time um, on sections two through six, the performance issues with ceilings, walls, windows, floors, and air sealing. And we'll talk briefly about a couple case studies and then we'll do kind of a recap and important goals. Um, but first we're gonna do a bit of a review of some of our basic issues. So for terminology, um, my favorite term is enclosure. Um, that's the word we used in, in the title, but building envelope or, or building shell are all fine terms for whatever we call the thing that separates us from mother nature. 
basically our ceilings, walls, windows, and floors. So for terms, we're not too picky about which one we want to use. And in Peter Yost class two, the building science class, um, he talked about what our building enclosures needed to control. Water, water vapor, airflow, and heat flow. And the building industry does an okay job at water and water vapor. And they've kind of learned that they're liable for those. Um, if there's a window leak or other water leak, or if there's a, a water condensation problem in a bathroom because it's not ventilated well enough, within the first 10 years, the builder themselves are kind of on the hook for fixing that. So they've learned to prevent those and properly handle water and water vapor pretty well. The second two, airflow and heat flow, the builder really isn't on the hook for those since we don't use a blower door on all houses and there's no firm standard and there's um, seldom any analysis of how well the, the performance of the insulation is to control heat. The industry isn't really good at those. And that's kind of a misaligned interest things. The first two, the builder's on the hook for. The second two, the homeowner is on the hook for uh, decreasing their comfort levels and driving up their heating and cooling cost. Well, since the builder, you know, kind of has a misaligned interest there, um, we're still working hard to get those up to par from a performance point of view. So heat transfer, um, Peter Lott talked about all three of these in his class. Um, we'll talk quite a bit about convective heat transfer, uh, fluids moving and um, air being our primary fluid that we talk about in building energy performance. Radiation is kind of an interest one, interesting one. There at the end of that, that block is the equation um, so if we want to calculate the BTUs per hour of radiant heat transfer, um, it's mathematically related to this uh, eight zeros uh, and then a one seven. So it's a tiny number times the area times the temperature difference to the fourth power between the two bodies radiating to each other. So in residential buildings, because that constant is so small and the temperature differences are so small, radiant heat transfer only has a minimal effect with the exception of our roof assemblies. The sun pro provides enough radiant heat transfer that radiation is an issue uh, through our, our roof sheathing. So this is introducing a concept that most of us don't think about much. It's the concept of boundary layers. So what we're looking at here, uh, the green is just a, uh, a sketch of a typical exterior wall. And that diagonal line through the wall is the temperature profile through the wall. And the interesting thing is note that the temperature profile sticks out of the wall, both on the inside and the outside. On the outside, uh, well, on both sides, there's a layer, a thin layer of air molecules that provides a really significant R value because we model the outside of our walls with a 15 mile an hour wind, typically, um, the R value of that thin layer of air molecules called a boundary layer or a still air film has an R value of 0.17. 
The more interesting one is the still air film on the inside because the air wind velocity inside the house is negligible. The R value of the still air film on the inside surface of the wall, that layer of molecules that lays infinitely close to the drywall has an R value of 0.68. And the drywall itself that's half an inch thick only has an R value of 0.45. So the still air film is actually a bigger resistance to heat flow than is the drywall itself. So we'll talk about still air films and how we can use them later in the presentation. And just a quick reminder, according to the California Energy Commission computer model, where the heat loss is by component. So this is a, a new energy efficient home modeled with the CBEC program and ceilings ducts and walls are all relatively small numbers. And our biggest heat loss areas are slab edge windows and the biggest air infiltration according to the model. And this is heating season stuff, um, varies a bit when we look at cooling season stuff, but um, this will kind of give us a relative idea of where we wanna focus our enclosure performance efforts. So barriers to enclosure performance and the magnitude of all these varies significantly, but the one we always talk about first is architectural complexity. Sometimes residential buildings are so complex, they're extremely hard to insulate so that the insulation performs properly and to properly air seal them, especially in light of price pressures, no testing and the lack of installer training. So when we look at architectural complexity, that can almost always only be addressed at the design level. So increasing designer awareness of how near impossible with any attention paid to price, it would be to insulate a turret with curved walls, two rows of two by fours, 24 inches apart. Um, it's so near impossible to do that affordably. Um, and price pressures are really a big deal in production housing. No testing. Once we don't install insulation that it doesn't insulation that doesn't perform well, kind of nobody knows because we don't all have infrared cameras and inspect the performance of the insulation. And training, well, that's why we're here. Um, at one point in my career, I was uh, in a new construction home and got to hear the training pro program for a new insulation hire. And the experienced installer told the new first day installer to make it pink. It was a three word training program since they were using Owens Corning fiberglass bats he, he was instructed just to make all the walls pink. So for insulation in general, um, these are our kind of universal performance factors. We need to have an air barrier, um, continuous and substantially airtight. And then the second and probably most important criteria is the insulation thermal layer needs to be in contact with the air barrier. And then of course, just generically, we never want gaps or voids or compression with our thermal layer. 
Um, another topic that Peter Yost talked about in class two was the importance of building tight and ventilating right. That should be our mantra uh, instead of our more common old mantra, which would, was houses need to breathe. So if we leave a certain size hole so that houses can breathe, what happens because wind pressures vary, the stack effect varies and mechanical effect varies, is that through that hole on a cold windy day, we get excessive air infiltration and an uncomfortable house. If we build tight and then mechanically ventilate properly, um, when the wind pressure varies on a cold windy day, um, we still have just the right amount of ventilation, but we don't have excessive air leakage. Um, on a cold day, the stack effect is at its maximum effectiveness. So on a mild windless day, we get near zero ventilation. And on a cold windy day, we get excessive ventilation and an uncomfortable house. Uh, mechanical effects, depressurizations, usually by supply side duct leakage, bathroom exhaust fans, dryers, kitchen range hoods, um, those vary tremendously and need to be dealt with as we build tight and ventilate right. And this is a topic we'll drive home later in the presentation, but the installation quality of the thermal layer, the building installation is more important than the specified R value. We'll just let that one sit until a little bit later. So that was our kind of review of a little building science and our enclosure basics. Now getting into um, ceiling performance factors and we'll treat ceilings and walls and floors and windows all separately. So going back to our performance factors that are specific to ceilings, um, number one is we need a continuous and airtight ceiling air barrier. And typically that's quite simple in that it's the ceiling drywall which is inherently airtight and continuous, except where it's interrupted by interior partition walls, which greatly complicates the whole issue. And then our universal performance factors, the ceiling insulation needs to be in contact with its air barrier. So the insulation needs to touch the ceiling drywall and then generically no gaps, voids, or compressions. So here's just a photo of R38 fiberglass bats installed in a trust ceiling. And the first performance criteria that will have a, a continuous and airtight air barrier in this picture will be a no brainer in that once these uh, trusses are drywalled and primed and textured and painted, it will be a very continuous and airtight pressure boundary. But the second performance criteria, the thermal insulation needs to be in contact with the air barrier is violated virtually everywhere in this photo. So if we look at the area kind of, um, if I can use my cursor, kind of in the center of the picture, this area here, the insulation is about eight inches above where the drywall will eventually be. So because the drywall and its still air films only have an R value of about one and a half, 
a lot of heat is going to conduct through the drywall and be in this space between the drywall and the building insulation. And convective heat transfer is gonna carry that heat up into the vented attic through openings here and here and everywhere else, um, even some at this overlap. So this area of, of insulation doesn't perform at R38, it might get R3 because of the convective heat flow up through this opening and into the attic. So as we look at other spaces, again, eight inches between the drywall and the insulation here with a big opening, big gaps here and openings to the attic. In this photo, the only place where we meet performance criteria is the corner of this fiberglass bat will touch the drywall and maybe the end of this one just a little. So all in all, the overall thermal performance of this assembly, um, though R38 is there and the computer model will model R38 as being there, um, performs more like an R3 to five, um, much, much below what's actually assumed by the computer models and the writing on the fiberglass bats. Another um, same issue under an equipment platform, um, because the insulation is not in contact with the drywall, except for a couple random tiny places, um, the air that the heat that conducts through the ceiling drywall will then convectively move up around the edges of the platform and in, into the attic. So an example of the architectural complexity us insulators have had to deal with, um, especially since the mid 90s and kind of through 2008, it was significantly out of control. Um, architects making things look nice, which sold well. So here is a thick wall with a niche and curved openings. And the problem with this is the industry, the insulation and air sealing industry did not keep up with the performance issues for these kind of features. So the question always is, is, is there an opening at the top of the thick wall where the electricians can run wires and convective heat flow carries all the heat that conducts into this interior wall cavity, something that would be modeled as an interior space completely inside the thermal enclosure. But that heat convectively rises up through the opening and escapes to the attic. So it has been improving that insulation contractors know to seal these but uh, we have thousands of new residential, relatively new residential buildings with this issue that nobody knows about until we test them with a blower door and an infrared camera. More architectural complexity. Um, here I'm, I'm looking at three interior columns. Uh, this is a slab on grade residential home with these three columns that separate the great room from the kitchen breakfast nook. And you can walk completely around these three columns. You can walk between the great room and the kitchen on the right. And there's an opening on the left where you can walk between the great room and the breakfast nook. So these three big columns and all their interior drywall, of course, are assumed to be completely interior space. 
But when we look at that same area with infrared thermography, we see that completely interior center column is full of cold air. And there's the leakage path to that interior column is over through the column on the left. It looks like it's sealed at the top of the center column, but there's an opening to the left. So warm air rises up through that up through that center column and escapes into the vented attic. A huge building defect, quite common, that never gets caught or very seldom gets caught. So apparently beautiful uh, loose fill uh, fiberglass insulation and Bats are virtually impossible um, to install properly in a trust attic. It's just too hard to meet our performance criteria that there are no gaps or voids or compressions, that they're in complete contact with the drywall. So loose fill insulation, whether it's fiberglass or cellulose, it inherently performs well and then inherently lays a course on the ceiling drywall. So if I was asked if this is good insulation, assuming it's the right depth and we don't see um, insul the mandatory insulation rulers to help us decide that, um, I would say we have no way of knowing because we don't know the continuity of the pressure boundary, the air barrier below this insulation. So once the attic insulation is installed, the only way we have to determine if it's performing properly is using an infrared camera and a blower door simultaneously to not only assess the performance of the insulation, but the performance of the pressure boundary. So exactly the same here, this in a, uh, a rare stick framed newer attic, and beautiful loose fill cellulose. But again, we have no way of knowing um, whether or not the uh, air barrier underneath this insulation is properly uh, sealed. So here's someone has done just an excellent job at cutting and fitting fiberglass bats around the bottom truss cord. And it would still fail our performance criteria. There's a, a section in the state energy code that outlines the required performance. Uh, this section is QII, quality, insulation, installation. And it specifically talks about if there is a void, a distance between the drywall and the front of the insulation, what its maximum um, height could be. And it's this by far going up and over that electrical box um, is violated there. So even though this looks quite nice, it still wouldn't pass our performance criteria outlined in QII. So the continuity of our pressure boundary in a ceiling assembly gets really complicated due to the architectural complexity. So this is a big interstitial cavity, a void space that the architect just didn't use. Um, and it's not properly fire blocked. So when we look at this picture, we look up and see that that four-sided sheet of OSB. And clearly the building inspector looked up and saw it and said, oh, there's your fire blocking, so all is good. But when we look a little bit closer, we notice that the ceiling level in the hall bath on the right over here is dropped a foot below the, the standard truss ceiling level. So that means that this 
area, if you can see my cursor, is completely open to the attic. So though the top of this interstitial cavity is, um, has a, a fire stop, the fire could still just make a little zigzag and move straight up into the attic. In the master bathroom in this floor plan also has a lowered ceiling over the vanities. And again, this whole area here is completely open to the attic. Between the master bathroom and the master bedroom, there's an arch. So there's an area here that's completely open to the attic. So though that is a life safety violation and building inspectors try to catch all these they miss dozens on every, at least a dozen on every house built between the mid 90s and 2000 on average. So this missing fire block is what us insulation subcontractors rely on as our pressure boundary. So though, um, you know, we'll install a bunch of insulation and it'll look good from above because of all these missing fire blocks. Um, we'll have very poor, especially wintertime performance because of the opening between these interior walls and the vented attic. More of exactly the same, a big thick wall, um, a foot thick and yet completely open to the attic. So always a warning sign for us insulators was when the electrician doesn't have to drill holes to get between a wall cavity and the attic, something isn't properly fire stopped. So this is how in retrofits, we catch these areas. So here's a big section of interior wall with tall ceilings, and it's all completely open to the attic. This is a, a wintertime picture. And by depressuring the house, depressurizing the house slightly with a blower door and looking even at interior walls with our infrared camera, we find these big sections of interior wall assemblies that are all open to the attic because of improperly missing, improperly installed or missing fire blocks. So just a little drop ceiling above all entry uh, closet. And what we're looking at here is uninsulated drywall but often there's no fire blocks between the, um, between the lower part of the wall section. So not only is the upper part of the wall section completely uninsulated and the insulation at the upper level is, goes to zero depth, um, these wall cavities are often found to be open which increases interior walls uh, heat loss. So this is a wintertime picture of cold air leaking down into an interior wall cavity, as well as the uninsulated drywall up, or up higher. So to review our ceiling performance factors, um, Continuous and airtight ceiling air barrier. And I sometimes use the word instead of air barrier, pressure boundary. That's more of a building science term that Peter used. And that's usually the drywall that gets complicated at all the interruptions to the ceiling drywall. Um, insulation in contact with the air barrier, which means loose fill is kind of inherently higher performance than fiberglass bats, which we find are near impossible to cut and fit around truss cords and web stiffeners and 
all the other obstructions. You know, one thing about the picture and the screen now is there's no additional obstructions from electrical wiring up there. So a lot of times we have tremendous amount of electrical and different uh, cables running through the insulation that need to be cut and fit around if we're using fiberglass bats. And generically, we never want gaps or voids or compressions. So moving on from ceilings to walls and our performance factors for walls. So there, there's a significant difference in the performance factors between walls and ceilings and floors. Ceilings and floors um, have typical insulation that's less than a foot or maybe 16 inches tall or deep. So the driving force for convective heat flow through a blanket of insulation that's only 16 inches tall isn't as great as the driving force for convective heat flow in a wall cavity that can be as tall as 10 feet. So we have, you know, on average, 10 times more convective driving height for convective heat flow in walls as we do in floors and ceilings. So that's the big difference between walls and ceilings. Um, we need a substantially airtight wall cavity um, to put our between framing members thermal layer in. We need our insulation to be in contact with the air barriers, plural. Often both the exterior sheathing and the interior drywall act as some proportion of the air barrier for the assembly. So for the insulation to perform properly, it needs to touch both of those, the exterior sheathing and the interior drywall, or put another way in contact with all six sides of the cavity. Our, our mantra for insulation installers is the thermal insulation needs to fill the cavity side to side, top to bottom, and most importantly, front to back. Most importantly, the exterior pressure boundary or, or air barrier and the interior drywall air barrier. Also impacting the performance of walls is the framing factor. The amount of wood that um, bridges the cavity insulation. Um, wood conducts heat about four times faster than does our typical insulation materials, whether it's cellulose or fiberglass or um, something else, denim. Um, so the more wood we put in a wall, the lower the performance is in that wood conducts four times faster. And then again, we always list no gaps, no voids and no compressions. So definitely a missing bat is not high performance. Um, the bat to the left, we we call um, when there's a gap between the, like here, the top plates and the insulation, we call that a gap where the insulation um, isn't in contact with the air barriers, we call that a void. So here the insulation's buckled over and that's a void. So we, there is kind of a designation in the code between a gap and a void. So um, a lot of problems here with insulation performance. And the reason is it is so difficult to perfectly cut and fill fiberglass bats to fit all the irregular cavities 
in modern, fairly complex exterior walls. Um, I did a survey on a 1,000 square foot condominium and I looked at the 140 different pieces of uh, thermal insulation that needed to be installed. And what I found was that none of them, 0%, could be just installed. Every single piece of insulation had to be cut and fit for irregular framing, spacing, obstructions of wiring and plumbing. Um, this 0% um, just install the fiberglass bat, which is relatively straightforward compared to cutting and fitting 140 pieces of insulation perfectly to meet our performance criteria of filling the substantially airtight cavity side to side, top to bottom, and most importantly, front to back. So this is a photo out of the California Energy Commission's energy manual. And this is few obstructions, fairly regular framing, and a complete performance failure. In that note how they tucked the sides of the fiberglass bats in, um, creating like a triangular void next to every stud. And just the typical friction of pushing a fiberglass bat into a wall creates similar triangular voids on the exterior. So having a fiberglass bat with a small triangular void in all four corners allows a convective loop to get started. So if it's in the winter, the hot air rises up the inside triangular void, figures out a way to get through the insulation on the top and falls down the exterior triangular void. And this convective heat flow loop um, functions in reverse depending on the, the season. So in the summer, it's the hot air moving up the outside and falling down the inside. The research has shown that even these little triangular void defects, which overall this insulation appears to be fairly well installed, but these little triangular void defects decrease the performance of the whole cavity by about 30%. Um, so they're significant. So this picture is shown in the energy manual as something that will never pass. So here, cutting and fitting is just so difficult. There's a big plumbing vent and irregular framing. And here, the bats are all too large for the cavities. So the edges of the bats buckle over, creating a, a nice big void for our convective loop to rise uh, in the winter and fall in the summer on the, on the warm side. So tremendously hard to get this, this stuff right, though it can be done. Wiring obstructions, you know, here the installer has put one bat in front of the wire and the next bat completely behind it. And what needs to happen to make sure that it performs is the bat needs to be taken apart and installed in two pieces with the right amount behind the wire and the correct amount in front of the wire. Uh, again, it's there are several ways to deal with this. Properly install the insulation um, and we'll get to later or remove the obstacle, the wire. So places like that and in infrared often look like this where we get an air leak at the electrical outlet and um, poorly performing insulation due to the obstruction. So why not just get rid of the obstruction? So one brilliant builder, before he 
takes studs out of, unstraps a unit of studs, he cuts a V-notch or drills a hole down through the bottom of his two by six studs. And then the electrical wiring runs across the bottom of the plate and is no longer an obstruction for the building insulation. So this is another one of those misaligned interests in that here the framer has to do a little extra work by drilling the holes, but the electrical contractor doesn't have to drill them, so he saves money. And because the trades seldom work together, you know, is the electrical contractor going to pay the framer to do this and give up some of his profit? So that working together and misaligned interests is always something that complicates getting little techniques like this implemented to make our thermal performance so much better and easier to accomplish. And then there's framing factor. So if we count the uh, cripple stud, there's 10 two by fours all side by side. And um, if you look at the house across the street, um, it's uh, these 10 two by fours, since the houses are similar, these 10 two by fours are on a gable end. So it's a non weight bearing wall that somebody thought they needed 10 two by fours to uh, hold something up. So this is an older picture. Um, this is a brand new picture from the Sacramento area. And here they're doing fry, five framing members around every single window. So in high performance buildings, which we'll show a few framing techniques here in a minute, um, we can get the framing factor down in the range of nine to 11%. So that means that nine, to 11% of the exterior walls are solid wood. Uh, a thermal bridge around the cavity insulation. This house was 35% framing factor. So over three times more thermal bridging. And of course, that means three times more lumber and three times more labor to install the lumber. You know, tremendous extra cost to not do it better. And we showed this turret before. So how would we apply our specific wall criteria um, to this 24 inch deep, curved turret with two layers of two by fours. And whatever we do, it's hard. Uh, spray foam would be an option. Other loose fills probably would not work in that the height is so great that there would be too much settling. Um, we might consider using a product uh, called Thermoply. It's a thin cardboard product that's foil faced and we might we can bend it and attach it to the outside of the interior wall of studs to actually create a cavity that we could then a create a substantially airtight cavity that we could then fill with with fiberglass bat insulation or a, or a loose fill behind fabric or blown so I always say that um, if the architect that designed this had to insulate it and follow our performance criteria, we wouldn't see these anymore. But of course, they don't have to insulate it. What happens is the insulation sub has to deal with it, but still meet the price pressures and timelines of the builder. So what we find is these are just horribly handled in that there isn't time or money to properly deal with them. 
So this is one of my favorite projects. This is Habitat for Humanity in Stockton, California. And the builder there um, is quite innovative. So this is employing aggressive advanced framing where single top plate, single bottom plate, 24 inches on center. The windows are sized and located so that they do not interrupt the framing layout. So this is actually, it's a small house. So the framing factor ended up at 11%. The bigger the house, the easier it is to get your framing factor lower, especially with nine foot ceilings. Um, so his framing factor here is 11%, um, which means that the wall is 89% properly installed insulation. And I say properly installed because, because the framing is so uniform, and this is the builder that drills the bottom of the studs, so there's no obstruction for wiring to deal with. He can install fiberglass bats um, or any other product, which are our cheapest products, our bat products, with near perfect installation quality because the framing is near perfect. So this is a building I built um, using the same techniques in where I live in Mount Shasta. And again, 24 inches on center, because I'm in a more severe climate, I built with two by eights, but even though it's a 3000 square foot triplex, a thousand square foot per unit, um, we only used one unit of lumber to frame the whole building. And my local building uh, inspector was skeptical when I told him we were going to do 24 inches on center, uh, single top plate, um, and all the other advanced framing, um, different pieces of technology. Um, he was skeptical that we could find a structural engineer that would approve it. And he was really skeptical when I told him that, well, we weren't going to have a structural engineer. This is all right out of standard framing outlines in the, in the building code. So all this can be done without a structural engineer and as engineer in a simple residential building. And this is the insulation, installation quality in the same building. Um, it's so easy to install near perfect fiberglass bats when the framing is near perfect. More, more of the same. So this isn't advanced framing, but it's um, perfect installation quality would pass all our performance criteria outlined in QII, quality, insulation, installation on a typically framed uh, two-story home. This is the first floor and the floor joists are going across. Um, this photo was actually on the cover of the residential energy manual for about eight years. Uh, an installer on, on my crew uh, did this installation. So what if we don't find a great insulation installer, a great bat fitter, and pay him enough to take the time to do it right, there are other options. Uh, this is spray applied cellulose insulation, and it's, it's the installation method that's the very most immune to installation quality. So, no defects here virtually ever. The uh, QII inspection for this would be near automatic. Um, we don't have to um, look very hard to say, yep, yeah, that's perfect. So if you're not gonna spray apply cellulose, 
you can spray apply fiberglass. So this is the John Mansfield spider system. And it has one advantage, well, actually two advantages to uh, spray applied cellulose. One, it can be used overhead uh, on sloped ceilings. And two, it doesn't take as long to dry. So you can drywall faster with this system. So both those systems are the most immune to installation defects, almost guaranteed that we don't have the installation defects. Um, we still have to deal with air barriers properly on both. Uh, but as far as insulation being in contact with its air barrier and the performance of the insulation near perfect. And our third method is loose fill behind fabric. Not quite as good as the previous two methods um, in that uh, an installer may not get the density quite as high as is, is needed to meet the R value, but another fantastic, more immune to installation defects method of installing insulation. So a special case Hey, Rick, before moving on, Erica had a question about um, if you could explain the issue with compression under number three. Um, compression, sure. Um, as we compress um, some of our insulation materials, the R value per inch can decrease. Um, for small compressions, the R value per inch actually goes up a little bit with fiberglass, which is why high density bats perform better than low density fiberglass bats. But when we have get past a certain point, then the glass fibers, for example, are touching each other and the um, R value per inch goes way down. So we want our insulation material to be at whatever thickness and density that is specified by the manufacturer um, and not excessively compressed because that's not what how the manufacturer intended it to be installed. Thanks, Rick. So our most difficult wall, attic knee walls. So this is a, a picture out of the uh, California Energy Commission manual. And it, the little uh, note says air barrier to be placed. To meet our wall insulation performance criteria, um, we have to have a substantially airtight cavity and attic knee walls are typically bare insulation on the attic side, which means they don't perform well. So where's our cavity that we're gonna fill um, side to side, top to bottom, and most importantly, front to back. So with attic knee walls, this is often what we see in infrared is a section of the attic knee wall just performing horribly. The technique we often use for attic knee walls is to insulate, insulate what cavities there are. You can see the white fiberglass here is cavity insulation. And then covering the attic side with a special product that's smoke and flame spread rated for attic exposure, and that's duct wrap. So here we've covered the attic side of an attic knee wall with R8 duct wrap to make the knee wall perform properly. And sometimes the top of knee wall cavities aren't enclosed. So here we've used extruded polystyrene 
to enclose the top of the cavity. So because attic knee walls have always been our most problematic uh, assembly, for years I've carried around a demonstration of how bad attic knee walls perform and used an estimation technique to actually measure the performance of the uh, insulation across the whole assembly. And to do that is just three simple steps. The first one is to assume that temperature profile line through our assembly is straight. And because this is an estimating technique, <laughs> um, we see that it isn't, but we're just trying to get an estimate. Then we measure the temperature difference across the still air film, knowing that that still air film has a resistance to heat flow of 0.68, and knowing the temperature difference across it gives us a way to um, do a, a simple ratio uh, for the whole assembly, uh, as long as we know the outside air temperature. So sounds like some math is needed, but somebody did a chart for us, so we don't need any math. Um, across the bottom of the chart is the temperature difference. Across the still air film, the temperature difference between the inside wall and the inside air. And up the right side is the temperature difference across the whole assembly. So in my attic knee wall demonstration, um, I framed a little section of attic knee wall that was about five feet wide and about four feet tall. And I insulated it with four different R values of insulation. One had no insulation. One uh, cavity had R11, another had R13, and one had R19. And this is what my knee wall demo look like an in infrared and I'd heat the area behind the knee wall to about 120 degrees. So the front side would be room temperature 70 and the back side would be uh, simulated attic temperatures at 120. So um, Infrared is such a cool technology, so it's so intuitive with the iron bow uh, color scheme. You know, when it's white hot, because there's no insulation like the right hand cavity, uh, that's the one with R0. On the other end, uh, the one that's the coolest, that cavity looks perfect. It must be the R19. Um, this one's kind of not as good. It must be R13. And this one's clearly for an insulated cavity that is the one that performs least well. So I hope that's all intuitive to everyone. But because this is a performance demonstration, um, the R0 is R0, the R13 is an R13 fiberglass bat, but this poorest performing bat is the R19 bat. And the bat on the left is the lowest R value bat, the R11, but perfectly installed in accordance with our performance criteria. So, this one has an uh, air barrier, a piece of paper on the attic side to provide a, a, a airtight cavity. And these two have other issues. So if we use our chart to estimate the actual R value across those four different things, what we get is the one that's uninsulated is about R2. So that's the resistance to heat flow to the, to the drywall and the two still air films. This 
R13 bat usually comes out about R13. It's a fiberglass bat, well installed, but it doesn't have an uh, air barrier on the attic side. Um, the R11 bat, perfectly installed in accordance with our performance criteria, estimated R value using our chart as R14. And the R19 bat comes out at 3.5. So going back to our chart, um, I measure about 10 degrees Fahrenheit across the still air film. The temperature difference across our, uh, the whole assembly is 50. So if we go across, we get 3.5 as an estimated R value. And that bat violates our performance criteria in, in two categories. Uh, first of all, it's bare fiberglass on the attic side. And second of all, it's craft faced paper is side stapled. So the paper facing on the fiberglass bat is not touching the drywall. There's a one inch gap between the um, back of the drywall and the front of the R19 insulation blanket. So that creates this beautiful convective airflow, hot air flowing over the top of the fiberglass bat, falling down through the cavity, finding its way underneath the bat and creating a, a big convective loop. So the point here is that R3.5 is specified and modeled as R19. And all we're getting out of it is 3.5. So little defects like this are so critical to assembly performance compared to specifying an R value. So this, what looks like a completely missing bat, when we actually go up and look at the defect, this is the defect. It's just a little air opening at the top of the bat where convective air currents carry all the heat right up into the vented attic. And looking like that, you wouldn't think that this little defect would be severe enough to create an infrared image that's that bad. But installation quality is so critical. So our review of performance factors of walls and let's uh, move on to windows. Our windows and doors are holes in the wall and windows are a big deal. Um, Heat loss 22% and heat gain, depending on the orientation and quality of the glass, can be way higher. So, looking at kind of four performance factors the performance of the glass, the frame performance, um, which impacts um, the visible light and the amount of frame percentage air leakage and a little bit on exterior shadings, which are kind of critical on retrofits when we're not replacing windows. So we all know how much of the sun's energy blasts through typical clear glass. Um, luckily in the last 20 years, the low solar, low E spectrally selective glasses have sure helped us fix this. So with new glass, um, it saves us so much energy in that it keeps the sun's energy out, keeps the heat in, um, and we still get adequate visible light. Low solar has been a godsend for our, our window performance. So here with the window open, we're getting on, at this oblique angle about 240, BTUs per hour per square foot. And we close the window and it goes down 60% uh, 
only 100 BTUs per hour. And this is an older example. The newer glass can do uh, significantly more than that. So often we see data on the visible glass, visible light transmission, but we don't want to pay much attention to that. We want the entire window properties. So with our favorite for California low solar gain glass, the glass itself is 60% visible light transmission, but the, for the whole assembly with um, a, a typically vinyl frame, we still get 50% visible light transmission. But the solar heat gain coefficient is only allowing 22% of the sun's energy in, cutting out um, that 78% that will overheat our homes in the summer, and a U factor of 0.31. Um, the glass industry continues to do better and better with the um, overall performance of our windows. So it wouldn't surprise me if now we can get a U factor. Um, for sure, with advanced windows, we can get U factors of 0.2 and solar heat gain coefficients down in the 1.8 range. Though these are easy to get for real affordable windows. We need to spend a little money to get that last little bit that's available. For air leakage, when we build tight and ventilate right, uh, fixed windows are a good option. So I have a ton of fixed windows in the building I built, and um, but it's ventilated with a heat recovery ventilator, so we don't need to open windows to ventilate, um, or where I live, let the force fire smoke in. Um, so fixed or quite tight, hinged windows do well, and sliders are kind of the worst for air leakage. And exterior shades, when we're not replacing windows, um, it's one of our best options to control solar heat gain in the summer. And they're so appropriate for California's uh, sunny and mild climate. Um, with a good enclosure built to high performance standards, we still recommend low solar windows in all cases in that it takes so little solar energy gain to overheat a house. We're kind of moving completely away from the old uh, direct solar gain, uh, put windows on the south side of your house that lets the solar heat in. We just don't need any solar heat in a, in a high performance enclosure. For large glass areas, um, in a retrofit situation, when we're not replacing glass, kind of the only option is exterior shades. Shade screens work well in all orientations, south uh, and west facing. Um, some of the awnings in different kind of shades, they work best on south facing windows, but we just need to pay attention to our sun exposure and our sun angles. So moving on to floors. So our floor performance factors are real similar to ceilings because our floor insulation is typically um, less than 12 inches tall. We only need one air barrier and we need the floor insulation to be in contact with it. And in the floor section, of course, mostly we talk a lot about slab edges um, in that they're more typical in newer construction and have tremendous heat loss. So lots of ways to do slab edge insulation um, on the exterior or 
uh, a a thermal break and then under. So in the building I live in, since there's radiant floor, we did the thermal break that went down 18 inches and then uh, continuous underneath the slab. More typical is to use sheet rock wool insulation on a slab edge and protect it with cement board that's painted um, that provides the mechanical protection. And this is the slab edge treatment on our second case study. Um, the Mike McFarland home in Redding, California. So sad but true, a real picture of insulation that doesn't do any good at all. Um, it needs to be in contact with the subfloor to provide any benefit. To make our subfloor continuous and airtight, holes like around tub drains need to be addressed um, here with extruded polystyrene. This is a job in progress um, showing just R19, which is a standard minimum R value or R38, uh, full depth fiberglass spats filling the cavity. Um, with this first installation, it's often called sag and bag, but we often see defects where the insulation doesn't remain in contact with the subfloor or that it's significantly compressed at the edges. So in retrofits, we virtually always include, as we reduce the air leakage, air infiltration in the house, we almost always include a high performance vapor barrier on the soil in the crawl space. Most of the moisture that enters a home, that in a home with the crawl space comes out of the crawl space soil. So as we tighten, a home, reduce the air leakage. If we don't also reduce the amount of moisture entering a home, we may cause problems. So a high performance um, air barrier, uh, vapor barrier on the soil is important. And very nice when there's mechanical equipment in the crawl space and that it provides a, a clean, nice work area to install mechanical equipment. On two-story homes, um, one of the often found building defects is where there's a front porch that's attached to an attic somehow, and yet nobody properly draft stopped the, in this case, the edge of the uh, parallel cord floor trusses. We get a case like this where air leaks into the whole floor assembly and creates uh, an assembly with no floor insulation for the second floor and no ceiling insulation for the first floor where the whole floor assembly is open to the attic. So a funner topic, air sealing. So our biggest single heat loss, um, according to the computer models, with tremendous variability. Um, in our most recent sample, the tightest home in the sample had two ACH50. And the leakiest house in the sample had 32 ACH50. 16 times more air leakage. So when we're sizing our heating and cooling equipment, when we're trying to anticipate heating cooling costs, if air infiltration varies that much, which is what all that data show, uh, we need to deal with it. 
So already showed this, it's like, how do we know when air is leaking into a big section of interior wall cavity? And the answer is we use a blower door and an infrared camera and take care of those areas. So this is the superintendent from Habitat Stockton. And he's an advocate of technology and innovation. So here's him with a blower door and a blower door test result that most builders would be very jealous of, but he was disappointed in. So a blower door test at 263 CFM 50 or about two ACH 50 for the size of this house. So on his next house, he worked harder and used a, a beautiful ceiling, air sealing technique since the majority of our air leakage is through the ceiling assembly. Um, he installed the ceiling insulation and drywalled the wall between the house and the garage and did an air infiltration test then and got 176 CFM 50 before any insulation was installed and before any interior, uh, excuse me, exterior wall drywall was installed. So at this point in the construction process, he had one ACH 50, 176 CFM 50, which is equivalent to about nine CFM natural before insulation and before drywall. And he accomplished that since he is the drywaller um, by using joint tape and taping the ceiling drywall to the exterior and interior top plates. So the top plates in the entire building. At this point, he can test and find every air leak and seal as tight as he wants to go. On, on the building I built 15 years ago, um, we used a different air sealing technique. And this one, I just turned over completely to a crew of drywallers. And the specification was they needed to glue the drywall in place, the wall drywall, not the ceiling drywall, in place everywhere it contacted a framing member. So if you look close at the picture, you can see the bright white caulk that they used to glue the drywall in place. So it's glued at every framing member um, and then of course screwed in place. And what that does is seal the wall drywall to the top plates. And then the joint tape will seal the ceiling drywall to the wall drywall. So it, it's always these interior wall partitions that where we find the majority of our diffuse leakage. So in each of my units, the blower door test averaged 81 CFM 50 or about four CFM natural. And I'm up in Mount Shasta where it snows once in a while. So those are the two air sealing techniques that um, are fairly straightforward, gluing the wall drywall or sealing the ceiling drywall that universally e yield great results. So two uh, quick case studies. Um, and both of these we talked a little bit about in class one. So because I have great data, I still talk about a home that was monitored, uh, built in 2005 and monitored for a year. And the point I wanna to make today for this class is um, that fourth bullet point down is we used conventional insulation. You know, looking at our specification and what the modeling would have said, is completely conventional. Um, our 21 fiberglass bats in the walls and our 38 loose fill in the attic. So that's what was specified, that's what was installed. Nothing exceptional, no matter how you look at it. 
other than good installation quality um, with every bat and everything. We also back then um, didn't necessarily get carried away with air sealing. So we had minimum air sealing. All we did, we didn't caulk every joint or seal the drywall to the walls or the top plate. Uh, all we did was replace all the missing fire stops. And we do that without talking to the framers or the builder. We just go use foil-faced foam board and replace all the missing fire stops. So that's another thing that just doesn't show up in the modeling or specifications. So by doing so, we were able to reduce our blower door test numbers by about 50% of what a normal house would be, just by assuring that we had a continuous and airtight sealing air barrier. And just by doing those things, which didn't really impact the specifications, the mo year long monitoring efforts showed that we reduced cooling costs by 81%, heating costs by 49%. So it's just that horrible disparity between high performance and what shows up in the modeling. Our second case study, again, one we talked about in the uh, class number one is Mike McFarland's brand new home in, in Reading. And it's all electric, both water heating and space heating with heat pumps, which is a good time to remind you that class four is on heat pumps in the high performance series. Everything got monitored clear down to the circuit level but insulation, he chose our most immune to installation defect insulation materials for the walls in the attic, uh, cellulose. So spray applied cellulose, each wall cavity gets filled uh, by spray, adding a little moisture to activate the glue in the material and overfilling the cavity. And then this is a device that scrubs the excess off of the cavity. It runs down the studs and just screeds or scrubs. It's called a stud scrubber. Uh, it scrubs the insulation back to be flush with the studs and yields an um, insulation blanket that's just near perfect. So he also installed um, exterior insulated sheathing at R10 or about over double what we usually have and ended up with just a spectacular enclosure. Um, he installed a heating system that was the smallest he could purchase, but still too big for the house. And his blower door result at the end measured with a duct tester was 0.52 ACH at 50, meet far exceeding our, our strictest air tightness standard. So this is kind of gets us to where um, our new high performance sh homes should hope to be is the stuff that Mike McFarland did on this brand new home. So just a quick recap. Um, Rick, could we um, jump in with a couple of questions? Absolutely. Okay. Um, Itzel, do you want to run through those? Yeah. So we have one from Thomas Moore. He says, cathedral ceilings required that insulation be vented. Therefore, insulation not in contract on both sides as in walls. Why can ceiling insulation be open on one side? And that's an easy one in that um, ceiling insulation is usually only 12 to 16 inches tall. So the convective heat flow driving force to move heat through it is fairly small. So we only need one air barrier. 
compared to a wall cavity where we need to fill that entire wall cavity to stop the convective driving force because the wall cavity can be as tall as 10 feet tall. So it's that 10 feet versus one foot uh, change in the convective driving forces that makes the difference. Thank you. And then we have another one from Julie. Um, she mentions, is it necessary to glue the GWV to the full studs or mostly just on the top plate? And the initials again? GWV. Oh, the ground vapor barrier. Um, <laughs> read the whole question one more time. I'm getting distracted. Um, is it necessary to glue the gypsum wallboard drywall oh. to the full studs or mostly just to the top plate? Oh, great question. I get it. I get it. Okay. Um, and the answer is, if you did the top plate and around the doors and windows and the bottom plate, it would be perfect. But to convey that to a group of drywall installers is too difficult. So what they understood was every place the drywall touches a stud, it has to be glued. And the other way, top plates around doors and windows um, and bottom plate would do exactly the same thing. So good catch. So I'd like to go on with the recap and we'll have time for questions at the end. So challenges and solutions. Um, you know, our building code, as we spent a ton of time on in class one is shown that new homes today should use about 9% of the heating, cooling and water heating energy, but the actual performance just hasn't kept pace and our modeling is seldom accurate, uh, especially in light of the tremendous variation we see in insulation performance, air leakage, and as you'll see next week, HVAC performance. So, you know, the lack of testing um, in our industry is something that the Energy Commission is trying to implement with HERS verifiers, but with little success in that HERS verifiers are only legally allowed to test to, to fail something if it doesn't meet the code minimum, um, not high performance standards. And a lot of the stuff they test, um, which is, more HVAC and less building enclosure, um, the minimum standards are so far from what high performance is. You know, airflow for a HVAC system minimum standard is 350 CFM per ton, which we seldom meet, but high performance is 550. It's just so, so huge a difference that it's not working what little testing we do see in residential buildings. Um, bid competition breeds optimism. Just over and over we hear, you know, we're all working to the same energy codes and energy standards. So my bid's cheaper, I, I'll do the work for you. And it's just, there's no pride in workmanship that goes along with getting, um, a job in that the only thing that matters is low bid. So a few specific goals um, for air sealing and insulation performance. So for air sealing, simple, find the air leaks and fix them. So, you know, using an infrared camera and a blower door, um, 
what we'd love to see and is relatively easy is to get our air leakage between 2.0 and 0.6 ACH 50. And we can do that in a typical stick framed building um, in almost all cases. And though our average is like in the neighborhood of four and a half ACH 50 right now. So we want them half, less than half the leakage and tighter. Um, some people would think that's hard, but once they set a goal and work to that goal, everyone finds it to be fairly easy to accomplish. So to get down to two ACH 50 is pretty straightforward and something we've done over the years just by um, catching the big stuff, catching the big leaks. Insulation performance, um, find the defects and fix them. How simple is that? Um, so again, we need uh, at least a 15 degree temperature difference across our assemblies and to do an infrared scan that shows zero defects. And again, this is pretty easy, um, sometimes impossible on your current project in that going back in and fixing a little defect isn't worthwhile. But as a training tool for the installers on the next project, it's perfect. So back when we started doing um, the guaranteed energy bills for heating and cooling costs, um, as our marketing campaign, which we talked about in class one, um, I would record a whole enclosure with an infrared scan, uh, record it and have video overdub. And the installers would watch it. And in three houses, they became zero defect installers. They'd see a part that they struggled with where there was a little um, insulation defect and they'd say, well, next time I'm gonna do this instead of that and I'll take care of it. So that feedback loop is just so brilliant and adds so much to worker satisfaction when they know they're doing a zero defect job. Oh, and just a couple last notes. Um, remember that there's no silver bullet. There's a thousand silver BBs. So besides um, air tightness and insulation performance, um, there's a lot of other things we need to get cracked. Um, and in the next class, a lot of those will be addressed on the HVAC side because it'll talk about heat pump for performance for both heating, cooling, and water heating. So that'll be the next class. So I think that's my last slide. Um, we're gonna do some 3C REN closing slides, and then we'll have some time, uh, hopefully almost 15 minutes for questions. Thank you, Rick, for that super informative presentation. Before handing it back to you, I just wanted to tell you all some information about the programs 3C Ren has to offer. We currently have the Energy Code Connect Building Performance Training and Home Energy Savings Program. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, I'm drinking <laughs> water, I can't, okay. No worries. Our Energy Code Connect program serves building professionals offering services to everyone from plants examiners and inspectors to architects and contractors. We offer three distinct services, the Energy Code Coach, which is an over the phone, online, over the counter, and in the field Title 24 consultant service. And yeah, it helps building professionals navigate the California Energy Code. We offer trainings as well um, that focus a little bit more on how to courses that are designed to increase overall energy code comprehension, compliance, and enforcement. And we also offer 
regional forums. Next slide, please. Our building performance training program currently serves prospective building professionals um, from architects, engineers, and real estate professionals as well. We offer expert instruction and technical skills related to building science principles and systems for high performance buildings, as well as soft skills training, such as sales, marketing, and communication techniques to broaden your business or start your career. Next slide, please. And for our home energy savings program, if you work on a multifamily property, we have the multifamily incentive program, which pays property owners incentives for comprehensive energy upgrades. And for our single family program, um, we offer incentives as well, payments directly that, you, that can be paid for the metered energy savings for customers. And we also do have a toolkit for this too that we offer through our library. So I'll, I'll put more information about that in the chat too, if anyone's interested. Next slide, please. Um, as I'm going over this slide, I'm, a, I'm a, about to launch a poll as well. Any feedback about our courses is much appreciated. So um, yeah, oh wait, for some reason that's not letting me send our, our poll right now. I'll send it directly through a follow-up email instead. But yeah, if you have any questions regarding continuing units, please feel free to reach out to me directly. I'll put my email down there. We do have um, uh, architecture units, um, AIA learning units. I, there's two for that. So if you're interested, please let me know. Um, we'll send out a follow-up survey, slides and recording for today's presentation. And these are some of our upcoming events for the month of July. So I'll add our calendar on here too. So you could go directly and, and visit that as well. Um, but yeah, if you have any other questions too, feel free to visit our dcrun.org page. And for any questions too, directly to our info at dcrun.org website. But yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for, for tuning in today. And I'll hand it back to, to Rick to answer any questions or if Erica, if you have anything else to add, um, feel, feel free to, but thank you. So shall we leave the poll up for a minute or should we move right to questions? Uh, I wasn't able to send it out, but I'll send it directly to the follow-up email. So I it, think I was able to launch it. It's, yeah, are, you, okay. are, are people seeing it? Yes. Okay, thank okay. you. Yeah, great. Thank you for filling that out. This is part of our CQC requirements and helps us improve the program. So thank you for just taking a quick moment to fill that out. Um, but I think we can do questions while we leave the poll up. Sounds great. And um, Rick, do you want people to just unmute themselves? Yeah. Oh, any way they want to do it. Um, if you'll read them, if there's some still in the chat or unmute themselves and we'll do it that way. Either is fine with me. Okay. I had a question while people are thinking about it. That um, spray, what kind of insulation was it? The spray fiberglass? Yes, spider. Is, are there safety issues? Is it more dangerous for the workers? It looks like a great product. I was just thinking that that might be kind of complicated to use. Um, you know, it's, it is a great product. And um, the big barrier is it's not the cheapest product, but from a performance perspective, being able to do slope ceilings overhead and walls, um, it's fantastic. So it's a John Mansville product that's been around for, oh, at least a decade uh, called Spider. Rick, I had a question. Yes, Javier. Um, yes, uh, thank you for all the information. Um, 
recently I've been working with a group of contractors um, on quality installation of the insulation and uh, they're, they got a lot of fails. My recommendation was to do, um, you know, uh, blown in behind the film uh, insulation. And we're having a hard time finding companies uh, that do the, either the spider insulation or the blown in behind the, the film. And uh, I was just gonna ask you if you have any contacts that you can maybe uh, send towards uh, the Ventura County area so we can start using some of these folks. Um, because I'm clear at the other end of the state, I can't help you. But um, one of my colleagues, and I think she was um, on this call, Judy Rachel, she keeps in touch. And I'll bet all the people at 3C Wren uh, might be able to help you with that one. But I think your recommendation is right on target. Doing QII with um, fiberglass bats is pretty close to impossible unless you have just some brilliant installer and very few of those exist. Yeah, it's really difficult. It takes them about probably three times to finally you know, pass the test the inspection and um, they're just uh, looking. I mean, I recommend, you know, let's just do it a different way so that you don't have to go through all this hassle. So that's gonna be the, the goal eventually. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. We have a question from Anastasia. If you want to go ahead and repeat yourself and ask it. Hi. I'm having trouble understanding. Is anyone else? Yeah. Yeah. I'm a fan of blown in cellular. Can you can hear me? Yes, now we can. Okay, sorry. So in a situation of retrofits where um, from a fire, a result of a fire and therefore the retrofit is undergoing, um, obviously interior drywall and insulation was removed. For the build back, would you say one of the best uh, processes would be drywall, vapor barrier and drywall the walls and then blow in your uh, cellulose as the previous Javier said with blowing it in under the film, I guess is your terminology. So um, first of all, we typically don't use vapor barriers in walls in all in any California climate. And without a vapor barrier, that enables the wall to dry if it gets wet in, in all directions. So vapor barriers are discouraged once we handle bulk moisture from the outside. So as long as rain can't get in, um, we don't typically want a vapor barrier anywhere in the assembly. And any of those products, spray applied cellulose or uh, loose fill fiberglass or cellulose behind fabric would be my recommendation, mostly because they're so much more immune to installation defects compared to uh, cutting and fitting fiberglass bats. Find the best use then moving forward for traditional bat insulation. The say that one more time, your audio cut out right at the beginning. Um, with traditional bat insulation, um, where you find the best use of it uh, would be in renovation pro projects, uh, i.e., um, soundproofing for floor and wall, um, interior wall assemblies for soundproofing, or where would you find the best use of bat? our insulation would application. Got it. So almost nowhere. Um, you know, fiberglass bats for soundproofing have been used for a long time. 
but only only accomplish minor sound level reductions room to room on interior walls and residential assemblies. If you're concerned about sound, there's other approaches with fab, um, rubber mats that actually accomplish good sound attenuation. But unless you have a fantastic installer, installing fiberglass bats in your thermal assemblies, your exterior walls, um, it's just so hard. So there really isn't much use for fiberglass bats unless you have an amazing installer. I'm now a believer. Yeah, thank you for that epiphany. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. We have another question in the chat. It says, can you touch on polyiso insulation? One more time. There's another question in the chat that says, can you touch on polyiso insulation? So polyiso um, is usually foil-faced foam board, polyiso saniurate, and our highest R-value board product typically. And there's not much to touch on other than it's an amazing product. Um, a little more expensive than expanded polystyrene um, or extruded polystyrene, but um, it's what our premier builder, Mike McFarland used on his home was two inches of foil-faced foam board or polyisosanurate. So great product. Follow-up question to that, recommended using between studs in a retrofit? So using the foil-faced foam board between studs in a retrofit? Yes, I believe so. Um, and a lot of work. It is our highest R-value product. So five R5 per inch typically compared to um, the other typical insulation products, whether it's fiberglass or cellulose at about four per inch. So you do get higher R value, um, but we need to, if we're cutting and fitting foil face foam board between studs, seal the edges so that it's airtight. We don't give, leave any gaps for convective currents. Follow up to that with expanding foam? Uh, yeah. Typically, we'd seal the edges with um, gun foam, a one part moisture cure foam that all the building product stores have, and have a, a nice uh, commercial gun to apply it that costs about $100. And those guns do something different than the little cans you buy at the hardware store in that the gun has the shut off at the tip of the applicator. So it precisely controls the amount of foam, plus it can be reused over and over and over. So um, the guns last years and years and every time you go pick it up to use it, you can accurately apply foam. So the foam doesn't get dry. In contrast, the, the little aerosol cans you get from the hardware store, you have to use them all at once and it goes all over and it's not the same as the commercial applicators. Can I ask a question? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, what about the spray isoline, the open cell, closed cell? I'm just curious. So I didn't hear you mention anything about that. I know it's expensive, but uh, you know, uh, just want to see how that compares to the other spray products. It's a great product. 
um, it's harder to use in that it's you know, quite a bit more expensive, takes well-trained applicators to get it right. And we just don't see it very often in the residential building industry. So, you know, something like the spider insulation is so much more um, user-friendly. Um, there's no hint of any weird chemicals in it or anything like that. So I don't know, we just don't kind of go in the direction of spray applied foam. I like it. Yeah, I'm just curious. And um, how do you spell spider just out of curiosity? I don't know. S-P-I-D-E-R, okay. I guess. I, I Google it, that. but I'm on a Zoom right now. No, no problem. That's silly, but that's that John Mansfield product. No, I appreciate yes. that. I've seen, I've seen it applied on in, um, you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, track homes and I'm a building inspector with the County of Santa Cruz and I've been following you for quite some time since I took building performance back in 2011 and seen you, uh, seen your, seen your work and I, I'm a fan and I, it's really nice to finally meet you, sir. Thank you. Great to hear. Thank you. Great, great, um, great uh, meeting as well. Appreciate it. I'm looking forward to additional ones as well. Thank you. We have one more in the chat that says, how many inches of pilo, pilo, polyiso in a ceiling? Um, so I guess I don't understand the question. Um, so foil-faced foam board in a ceiling assembly typically isn't used um, because Foam board is so expensive. Um, if it's a typical ceiling assembly, um, the only way to go is with loose fill fiberglass or cellulose in that it's so affordable. So I, I need to see the specific situation. The only place we may use a foil faced foam board would be in a, a raftered ceiling. And that's kind of a special case that we don't have time to get into. Thank you. I don't see any more questions coming in anymore, um, but feel free to, to ask any if there's any <laughs> other questions. I know we're at our stopping point. So yeah, please, please let us know. Great. Time for lunch. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you very much. Everyone. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you again. Bye.